2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Now I'm going to lay a foundation and I'm going to be taking you through uh, 2 Corinthians in an in-depth fashion, meaning it's going to take a little while for us to get through it. And I'm going to spend some time looking at it in, uh, in smaller doses because I really think that it's a, a book that's worthy of us taking our time to look at. So let me lay down an introduction, give you some background, some information that will, will help us to view this book as we go through it in an in-depth fashion. Now, this particular church, this Corinthian church, was very dear to the Apostle Paul. And the reason it is very dear to him is because he's the one who planted the church. He was what would be referred to as their father in the faith of Christ. Paul went on a series of missionary journeys. These journeys are outlined for us in the book of Acts. He had three missionary journeys. This particular church was planted on his second missionary journey. And it tells us in uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 11, that Paul stayed for a year and a half there in the city of Corinth and he was teaching them the word of God. Now, early in the history of this church, problems had developed and the problems were severe enough for the apostle Paul to actually write a letter to them, 1 Corinthians. As you look at 1 Corinthians, you'll see things about the church. <clears throat> you'll see that they were saved, they were spiritually gifted, but they were guilty of living very carnal lives. And so when you study through 1 Corinthians, you see that there was division in the church and the division had arisen over a variety of things. Division had arisen over comparisons between Paul and other teachers, uh, sexual immorality. There were problems with their marriages. They were dealing with questions of idolatry. They were trying to determine the roles of women in the church. They were having bad behavior at communion services. They had questions concerning spiritual gifts, questions concerning the resurrection and what that means. They had questions related to stewardship. And all of these questions had to be asked and answered by the Apostle Paul. Now, as mentioned, Paul, as the founding pastor, had a great love and a great concern for this church. And it was out of this concern that he had actually written the first letter that he wrote. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul said this. He said, Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. You may have 10,000 people adding to your faith, instructing you concerning the things of God, in other words, you may have a great amount of people who are contributing to your maturing in faith. But you need to remember one thing Paul was saying to them back then, and that's what's prompting him to write now. You need to remember that you came to faith in Christ through my ministry. You may have 10,000 teachers, but you only have one father. I'm the one who begot you in the gospel. And it's from that perspective that the apostle Paul writes his letters. You see, since he had written 1 Corinthians, 
the problems had continued, but they had even begun to worsen because false teachers were now infiltrating the church at Corinth. And they were not only infiltrating, but these false teachers were bringing accusations against the, uh, the apostle Paul. They were bringing false charges against him. Now, as is typical of those who divide the church, their accusations concerning him were not based necessarily on his teachings. You see, a lot of times when people want to divide a church, they don't necessarily put their attention on the teaching ministry of the church. It's not that they won't, and there are those who do. But very often, when somebody wants to divide a church, when somebody wants to create a problem in a, in a fellowship, it isn't always about the doctrine that's being taught from that pulpit. Very often, they will bring accusations that are based on other things. They'll say things about the pastor and his character. They'll, they'll speak concerning his personality or lack thereof. They'll say that the church doesn't have their, the entertainment value. They don't enjoy themselves there as much as they'd like to. They talk concerning a variety of things about the way the ministry is performed or sometimes even the appearance of the minister himself. There are people who call into question those things. And, and when we go through 2 Corinthians, a lot of the things that we're going to be looking at are things that Paul has to deal with because of the accusations that have been made concerning him. As a matter of fact, throughout this letter, Paul responds to their accusations and he responds no less than 21 times, 21 separate accusations that have been lodged against him. And he will be dealing with this. And I, I'll show you how I'm going to be dealing with this because you need to know that as you go through this, this uh, passage, or rather this, uh, this book, you need to know what he's doing when he, when he writes certain things. If you, if you understand that he's dealing with accusations, it begins to make sense. And I'll show you a couple of those. I, I actually have 21 things listed here that I'll, I'll just read to you. But one of the accusations is found in chapter 1, verse 12. In chapter 1, verse 12, he answers an accusation that he is uh, he's selfish, he's hypocritical, that he uses fleshly wisdom. That was an accusation. But notice how he goes about handling that. Because in chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you, not with fleshly wisdom. Why did you say that? And why are you saying how you conducted yourself? Well, because somebody is lodging an accusation against him that he's selfish, that he's hypocritical, that he uses fleshly wisdom, and that's how he answers it. In verse 17, there's an accusation that he changes his mind and his plans easily. You see it in verse 17, but notice how he responds. He says, in verse 17, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me, there should be yes, yes, and no, no. What are you doing, Paul? I am responding to an accusation where people say that I change my mind easily, that I'm fickle. And I'll give you one more instance in verse 21 in chapter 1. There was an accusation. Paul is self-appointed. And his response in verse 21, it says, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. And so these people had come in and they're lodging these accusations. He is selfish. He changes his mind and plans easily. He is self-appointed. In verse 24, they said he lords it over the church and dominates their faith. In chapter 2, verse 4, we'll see this. They say he's nothing but an unemotional intellect. In chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, he's legalistic. He forces people to leave the church. In chapter 2, verse 17, he uses the gospel, insincerely peddling the word for personal gain. In chapter 3, verse 1, he has no proper credentials. In uh, chapter 3, verse 5, he's self-righteous and self-sufficient. He labors in the flesh. Chapter 4, verse 2, he's impure. He's crafty. He uses deceitful tactics. He twists God's word. He ensnares them. Chapter 4, verse 5, he preaches himself and not Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 13, he's a madman. Chapter 7, verse 2, he has wronged, corrupted, and defrauded the church. Chapter 8, verse 4, he uses guilt to get money. Chapter 10, verse 1, when he's with people of Corinth, he is cowardly. Chapter 10, verse 3, he uses the flesh to perform spiritual works. 
Chapter 7, verse 7, or rather 10, verse 7, he's ugly. Now, isn't that sweet? Not, all, not only does he have character de deficits, but it's only two. In chapter 10, verse 10, he's untrained in speech. In chapter 11, verse 5, he is their spiritual inferior. In chapter 11, verse 7, he's not worthy of support. In chapter 12, verses 14 through 16, he uses guilt to ensnare people. You're going to see this as we go through 2 Corinthians. And that will give you some insight into this very open-hearted letter by the Apostle Paul. Though you may have 10,000 instructors, yet you only have one father, I have begotten you in the gospel. And these infiltrators who have entered in trying to steal your heart from me need to be dealt with. And that's what Paul does in 2 Corinthians. Who were these false teachers? Who were these people who entered in? Who were they anyway? Well, we know, one, that they're intruders and that they came from outside the church. How do we know that? Well, in chapter 3, verse 1, he, he says this, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles or letters of commendation, letters of recommendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? That gives us insight that these were people who came in from the outside. They were also, according to chapter 10, verse 5, what we would today refer to as pseudo-intellectuals who fashioned argument that lacks substance. So one, they're intruders. Two, they're pseudo-intellectual. And then three, they are proud, claiming a superior ministry to Paul because he refers to them in chapter 11, verse 5 as being super apostles. And then fourth, they were mercenaries. They were greedy for gain. They drew disciples after themselves because he refers to that in 2 Corinthians 11, 7 and 8 when he says, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you. These people, on the other hand, were greedy for gain. And then fifth, we know that they were Jewish, possibly attempting to bring believers into the bondage of the law of Moses because he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. And so he gives to us in this epistle a very open-hearted defense of his ministry and he deals with the accusations that have been made that are intended to steal the hearts of the sheep from Paul who had begotten them in the gospel. There is, and I'll say this briefly, because I really do want to get into our study. But there is a love that a shepherd has for the sheep that validates that shepherd's ministry and that reveals that shepherd as being a genuine shepherd. There are those, and I can tell you this in, in this way, and it is personal and it's personal application, but there are those who have over the years, for whatever reasons may have been in their own hearts, there are those who have done their very best to drive a wedge between me and members of this fellowship. These accusations that the Apostle Paul has dealt with are accusations that every pastor will eventually find, at least some of them, not all of them, but some of them, and over 39 years of ministry, I have had pretty much many of these accusations lodged against me. And my friends who've been in ministry for a while, many of my friends could say the same, that there are people who creep in, look around, begin for whatever reason to try to undermine the ministry, begin to lodge accusations, and... Uh, and in doing so, attempt to steal the hearts of the sheep. And the Apostle Paul would say, this isn't right. You have all of these people influencing you, but you need to remember who brought you to faith in Christ. And you need to remember the love that Paul said he has for them. There's a portion of Scripture, we'll see it in chapter 12, when he simply asks the question, or makes the statement. He says, he says though the more I love you, the less I'm loved by you. So he, he understood in a deep and personal way 
the relationship between a pastor, teacher, a minister, and the sheep. And these individuals have been creeping in and they're attempting to undermine the ministry that God had given to him. Now, Paul had received a report that this was taking place and so he had sent Titus to see what the condition of the church was. Well, Titus actually came back and gave an encouragement to him. You see then in <laughs> chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, when he says, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. So he says, it's a good thing to hear that you still have a loyalty to me as your shepherd. I love you very much, and it causes me great joy to know our relationship is strong. But that's prompted him to write this epistle. And so let's begin. We'll begin with the basics, verses 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians, when he says, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin by breaking this down. Apostle. This is a typical greeting of Paul. Paul, an apostle, is a greeting that is used nine times. He uses it in nine of his letters. An apostle means apostolos. It means one who is a delegate or a messenger. He uses the word apostolos or apostles 81 times in total. And so he's speaking concerning the fact that he has a relationship with the Lord where God has delegated authority to him and he identifies himself that way. So Paul, an apostle, he goes on to say, and Timothy, our brother. Timothy was an individual that was known by the church who was uh, saved under the ministry of the apostle Paul. So they're familiar with him. And so he's saying, I'm writing this and I'm bringing a greeting to you from Timothy, whom you also know. And so he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints. Now that word church is ecclesia. It's, it, it speaks of a group of people who are called out of the world by God. Even as Jesus in John 17, 16 said, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And so the church is ecclesia. We are the separated ones. We've been called out. And so he's speaking of those who have been called out by the Lord to follow Jesus Christ. So he says, to the church of God with all the saints. Now, the word saint is the common designation in the New Testament. It's used 63 times in reference to believers in Christ. And so it's very basic. I've said this. I say this all the time whenever I see these introductions. You know, so many times what we do is we take the word saint and we elevate it to a certain position. So an individual is a saint if they live in a certain way or perform certain works or whatever. And we've taken that word and we've actually made it what it didn't mean in the early days. The word saint speaks of one who is separated. Hagias, it's a person who has been separated to the Lord. It was the most common designation of a believer. So every person in this room who's saved is a saint. Now you may not consider yourself because we've elevated that position to such a degree that we use it in, in almost a disparaging way when we'll say, well, what do you think you are, some kind of saint? Well, if you're born again, you are a saint because in scripture, either you're a saint or you're an ain't. There's no in between. <laughs> See? And so when you get saved, <laughs> excuse me, when you get saved, you enter into a relationship with God. And so it's a very common designation. As a matter of fact, it's not a bad thing for you to think of yourself in that way. I have been separated by God to his service. My life has been called out of this world, out of the miry clay. I've been made to stand on a solid rock. I'm in Jesus Christ. I'm born again. I have the power of the Holy Spirit resonant within me. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven is my home. I'm just passing through. I'm not going to get bogged down with this world because I've been called out by God to live in a different way because I'm a saint. And so that's basically what he's saying. He's saying you have been set apart. And so as he's saying this, notice he says to the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia. All Achaia, Achaia is a region. And so he's basically saying that this particular letter is not simply for the Corinthians, but it's one of those letters that can be circulated amongst the rest of the believers. Well, he says in verse two, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. The word grace was the common greeting of a Greek to another Greek during the time of the writing. So if you're a Greek, a Gentile, and you walk up to a friend or somebody you know on the street, you would simply say, Charis. K 
Karis was like, what's happening? It's just, how you doing? It's a greeting. How are you? It, it means grace. But he's giving a greeting here, so he starts off by saying Karis. But he also says peace. Peace was the common uh, salutation of the Hebrew. So he's saying Karis and Shalom. And he's combining the two. Karis for the Greek, Shalom for the Jew, combining them. One of the things you will note when you study your scriptures is this. You will not see a greeting where it says Shalom and Karis. It's always Karis and Shalom. That's because peace will only be experienced after you've experienced the grace of God. And so you have to have God's grace to have his peace. You will never have his peace until you have his grace. And that's why when you study your scriptures, you will see that the designation is always grace and peace. It is never peace and grace because it always takes the grace of God for you to experience the peace of God. And so he speaks in that way. Now we're going to get into the meat of the study. This is, to me, this is, I love this portion of scripture. We'll look at it now in some detail. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are any in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Now, Paul immediately begins to deal with the accusations he's been receiving. This opening section intends to remind them that ministry isn't easy and that plans can change. He had closed his first letter by disclosing his plan of coming to see them soon. In 1 Corinthians 16, 5, he had said, After I go through Macedonia, I'll come to you, for I'll be going through Macedonia. So he begins here by explaining why he didn't show up. And he's going to spend the rest of the chapter doing so. You'll see this in verse 23 of chapter 1, where he says, Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. So he takes chapter 1 and actually alludes to this clearly to deal with the fact that these people were saying, this man has no integrity. This man doesn't love the people. He doesn't have integrity and he doesn't have love. This is a common charge lodged against ministers. To say that the guy doesn't tell the truth and the guy doesn't love the people. That's one of the ways that people will undermine relationships. That's one of the ways that they do it. Let's say if they really loved you, they wouldn't lie to you. How come he's lying to you? He said he was going to be there. He didn't show up. This is supposedly a man of God and yet... He said to you, and he said it in a letter, he's going to show up. He did not show up. Now, that tells me that you can't trust him because if he's not a man of his word, didn't Jesus say, let your yes be yes and your no be no? And if you're not a man of the word, if you're not a man who keeps your promises, then that tells me that you're making false promises because you don't love the people. Because if you love the people, you wouldn't lie to them. And this is the kind of stuff that was said amongst the people in Corinth. The false teachers were saying, Paul lies to you and Paul doesn't love you. If Paul loved you, he would have shown up. If he was a man of God, he would have lied. So that means that he changes his mind easily. A man who is, changes his mind easily is unstable as water. And you cannot trust a man like that because a man who's in leadership needs to be solid. He can't be one of these who wavers. He can't be like a reed in the wind that is moved by every wind that comes and blows it one way and then moves it another. 
A leader has to be an individual who stands straight and makes a decision, holds fast to it, tells the truth. And it all has to be wrapped up in their love for you. And so if Paul really loved you and if Paul were really a good teacher, he would have done what he said he was going to do. He didn't do it. Therefore, he's a liar. And also, he doesn't love you. So right from the beginning, Paul has to deal with that. And he makes it very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ sometimes will move you in a different direction, even if you didn't intend to, uh, to do exactly uh, what ultimately happened. Now, as he goes on here, he begins by saying, I want to give praise to God. I want to give thanksgiving to God. Now, this is, this is interesting. Verse 3 is a blessing. When he says, in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and God of all comfort. He begins with thanksgiving. Blessed be. Why are we blessing God? Well, we bless God for his comfort because God gives us comfort in our times of pain and God gives us comfort in our times of distress. You, say, you see, instead of receiving judgment for being a fickle vessel, instead Paul is making it very clear, I have received mercy from God. And I understand the ways of the Lord. Recently, I was sharing with you how that when Paul was saved, he was saved in a very miraculous way. When you read the book of Acts, and it speaks concerning the explosion of the church within the first eight chapters of Acts. When you get to chapter nine, you're introduced to a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. The word Saul, the Hebrew word Saul, can be translated great. Saul was great. When Saul gives his testimony later on, and he does so several times, he speaks of the fact that he came behind in terms of his knowledge and understanding of God's word. He came behind nobody else. He was a premier stu student of the Bible. He was one of the greatest minds of his day. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. This was a man who had tremendous learning and tremendous zeal. And when he started hearing the gospel being presented that Jesus was Messiah, it got to him to such a degree that he began to breathe out threatenings concerning those who were followers of what was called the way. Christianity originally wasn't referred to as Christianity. It was simply the way. It was called the way because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so they referred to him in that way and followers of the way. That's what we originally were called. Believers in Christ were called the way. He was breathing out threatenings concerning those who were followers of Christ. And he had gotten these uh, letters from the uh, Jewish authorities to take people who were followers of Christ, put them in chains, bring them back to Jerusalem, and to have them tried as heretics. And in his journey, he was on his way to Damascus, Syria. And on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ knocked him down, blinded him, and when he did so, Paul was without sight for some time, but he knew that there was a man by the name of Ananias who was going to be sent to him to pray for him that he might receive his sight. So after Saul was unable to see, God began to speak to this man, Ananias. And when God began to speak to Ananias and said to him, I want you to pray for Saul, Ananias took it upon himself to instruct God to remind God that in the event that you've been so busy in the universe and haven't noticed this, this guy's a monster. He's going out. He's arresting people. He's a great persecutor of the church. But God answers him, speaks to him. It's found, as I mentioned recently, in Acts 9, 15, and 16. And the Lord said to him, Go your way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul was somebody who understood suffering. He was somebody who had gone through it. He had gone through tremendous trouble. And, and he mentions it later on. He had gone through tremendous trouble in Asia. In verses 8 and 9 here in the same chapter, notice, he says, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. 
So he says, we've gone through some very heavy times, a lot of pain, a lot of affliction, a lot of suffering. As a matter of fact, his ministry was filled with suffering. But instead of it being God's judgment on him, as some people think whenever they go through tough times, they'll say, surely God is angry at me. God is causing me to suffer in ways. Perhaps I've been more evil than somebody else. And he's pouring out his anger on me. Well, instead of him seeing it as God's judgment, he knew that God was working in the midst of it and that the deliverance that God brings is a demonstration of his favor upon Paul. And that's why he writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God because in spite of the fact that I'm going through these things, God is the God of all comfort. And God is the God of all mercy. And God will see me through all of this. Now he speaks in this way. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. God is a God of consolation. God is a God of comfort. And you see it throughout the scripture. You see that God brings consolation and comfort. As a matter of fact, consolation and comfort are key words that are used 17 times in this letter. The words comfort and consolation are used 10 times in these verses, but there are other words like affliction, suffering, trouble, tribulation. They occur seven times. And what he's saying is God is a comforting and merciful Father. Now, if God is a comfor comfortable, a comforting and Consoling Father, here's something for your practical application. If God brings comfort and consolation, and if I am God's child, doesn't it follow that I also should be known for bringing comfort and consolation to others? And the answer is yes. Every believer, listen carefully, every believer ought to be known and this is a challenge from Scripture that God gives to me that I'm going to just hand to you too. Every believer in Jesus Christ ought to be known as one who brings comfort to others in one form or another. And also, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're children of our God who is God of all comfort and a Father of mercy, every one of us, ought to have as the fruit of the Spirit love, the application of this love through our comfort and consolation that we give to other people. When God brings consolation to me, it's not just to make me feel better, and you'll see this in a moment, but it's so that I can take the consolation God gave to me, the comfort that God gave to me, and extend the same to other people. So when God works in my life, it's not just for me. When God is working in my life, it's for the body of Christ. It's for us all. And so God is a God of mercy. God is a God of comfort. God brings consolation to us. But God would intend us to be of that to somebody else. In Matthew 10, 25, Jesus said, it's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. When you look at Jesus, he would see the people hungry and fainting. And the scripture says, and he would have compassion on them. He would heal their sick. He would teach them the word because he's a God of comfort and compassion. Part of the way that God brings comfort, part of the way that God brings comfort is through the body of Christ through the church. As the body of Christ, it ought to be our aim to encourage and comfort one another. It's been said, Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. No hands, but yours. No feet, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion is to look out to the earth. Yours are the feet by which he is to go about doing good. And yours are the hands by which he is to bless us now. And so in one, in one way, guys, the body of Christ should be known as a compassionate, loving, caring, 
group of people. And there are times when somebody in the body of Christ can bring a word of comfort to my heart when it's grieving. When I've gone through times of loss, when I've gone through times of sorrow, and a brother or a sister will write me a card. When mom went home to be with the Lord a few weeks ago, people wrote me cards. I didn't ask for cards. I didn't say, oh, oh please, I'm brokenhearted. Send me a card. But people did. People wrote little cards and they said, we're praying for you. People on Facebook who are my friends wrote little notes to me, praying for you, love you, pastor. Those were the hands of Christ. That was God moving. They were showing compassion. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. We're supposed to comfort one another. That's what we're called to do, to love one another, not to bite, not to devour, not to tear up, not to gossip about, not to rip, but to love. That's what it's all about, right? And God is a, a, a consoling and, and comforting God. And, and that's what he's saying to us. He's saying God brings that. One, he, he has a church, the body of Christ, that performs those functions that take the invisible God, if you will, and incarnates him afresh as the church acts as God has called us to. But ultimately, our true source will always be not the church itself, but God himself. Because there are times that you will be hurting so desperately, nobody knows that you are. You won't even tell. You won't even say. There are people that, that go through pain silently. They don't tell anybody. They don't have anybody that they can say, I'm hurting to. I'm in need of a, of a prayer. I'm in need of, of somebody's arm around my shoulder. There are times when that's just not practical. It's not going to happen. But what I've learned to do is, one, as I appreciate the body of Christ so very much, but two, I know who my comforter is. It's God himself. God is the one who gives you that deep inner peace, that, that sense that he's with you. He's never left you. He's not going to forsake you. It's the Lord who does that. It's the Lord who has a little vial that he keeps all your tears in. He has a bottle, the psalmist says, that God keeps your tears in. He knows your broken heart. He knows your broken plans. He knows how people have betrayed and hurt you. He knows how you've been forsaken. He knows all of that. But he has said, I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. And Jesus one time said to his father, now I'm alone, and yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. And so a human being can only do so much for you. Thank God for loving, compassionate people who are, go out of their way to be there for you. Thank God. But your true strength comes from knowing that the master, the Lord, the creator of the universe is your comforter. He's the one who's beside you. He's the one who walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's why when he's walking with you, you fear no evil because he's with you, you see? And so Paul is simply speaking about the fact that he went through some very terrible times, but God was there and God brought comfort to him. He's, he expresses this praise to God in verse three. He's not filled with bitterness over his various trials. He's saying, I received God's mercy. I, 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 I received mercy instead of that which I deserve. He has given to me compassion. And he's given to me comfort. He's given to me rest. He's shown me these things because that's what he does. He says in verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So your ability to give comfort is tied up with your experience in receiving it. You can only ultimately give to others what you yourself have received. And Paul has received great comfort. And therefore, Paul gives great comfort. When I was a young man in Bible college, my professor, Dr. George Moore, once said to the, the students that he was teaching, said to us, and this was back in 1973, he said, there's, a, there's something out that people are saying now, which was actually a new phrase back in 73. At least it was new to me. 
He said, there's something that you young people are saying now. You're saying this, you're saying, I want to be on fire for the Lord. We used to use that phrase. That was a common phrase that we used amongst ourselves. We'd say, how are you doing, man? And we'd say, on fire, man. I'm on fire for the Lord. And, and that was a common thing going on at that time. We weren't embarrassed about following Jesus Christ. We wanted to glow. We wanted our light to shine. We wanted to be consumed with him. And so we would say it. We'd say, I'm on fire for Jesus. Well, my, my professor, Dr. Morris, said this. He said, you say you're on fire for the Lord. Never forget, fire burns and fire consumes. And I've never forgotten that phrase. I've never forgotten what he said. Fire burns and fire consumes. And it was making it very clear to us that if we're actually going to be on fire for the Lord, there's a cost involved. And sometimes people don't understand that. Sometimes they have this, why me? How come this is happening to me? I was reading in Jeremiah just the other day, chapter 12, how that Jeremiah starts to speak to the Lord and he says to God, you know, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, but he says, you're, you're great and you're awesome, but if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your judgments because things weren't going well for Jeremiah and he wanted to kind of have a discussion with him. You see it in the book of Job where Job is going through so much pain. First two chapters, he loses everything. And then here comes his friends. With friends like that, who needs enemies? I mean, these guys came and sat down with him and the best thing they did is when they sat quietly. That was the best that they could do. Because once they opened their mouth, they were jerks. I mean, they just kept on just piling on and pouring on. And Job would defend himself. And he defended himself through all the chapters, in the early chapters, until right around chapter 39, chapter 40. And he's defending himself and defending himself. I haven't done these things. I haven't been this way. And he says, oh, that I only had a, a daysman. I wish I had a, a lawyer who could plead my case for me, who could stand to God and say, God, I'm defending this man here. He's innocent. Oh, that I had someone like that. And then finally, God begins to speak to Job. We know the story of Job. And God says, gird yourself like a man. I've got a few questions to ask you, and I want you to give me the answers. And God begins a series of questions with Job that to God are simple questions. But as it goes through this, where were you when I told the seed to stop here and go no further? Tell me if you know. Explain to me these very basic things, Job. I'd like to know these things. And goes on and on with simple things to God that were beyond Job's ability to understand. And finally, what's Job's response? Job says, I cover myself with ashes. I cover my mouth because I have spoken in a way that I ought not to. He said, I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now I see you with the seeing of my eye. And because of that, I humble myself before you. Who am I that darkens counsel? Who am I that should call into question your ways? If you want to be deep with the Lord, if you want to be deep with the Lord, let me tell you, the average Christian doesn't. The average Christian doesn't. If you want to be deep with the Lord, you will go through deep things. You will go through pain. You will go through what I call, and it's been called, the dark seasons of the night, where the seasons of the night seem to oppress you so deeply. The pain can be so heavy. The sorrow can be so severe. The loneliness can be so painful. And it gets to the point where you realize that there is just one thing I need, and that is him. And when you get to that point, you've grown. When you get to that point, you're understanding. Because the Lord will reduce you to nothing so that he can build you into his image. So he can transform you into the likeness of the one who has been referred to as our suffering savior, our wounded healer. If you want to be used by Jesus, you will go through deep things. Now, am I scaring you off? I hope not. Someone says, well, I really don't want it that much. I just want to go to heaven. I mean, come on, man, you're bumming me out. I came here after supper, and you're making me want to puke. I 
I want to be deep in the Lord. I've wanted to be deep in the Lord since the day I got saved. That doesn't mean that I have become deep because I haven't. It simply means I want to be. And I'm only telling you what is true. Paul said, God is my comforter and he is the one who is merciful. He's my merciful father. He comforts me in all of my affliction, no matter what it is I've gone through, because that's what he does. But it isn't just for me. It's for you. I went to see my pastor, Chuck, many years ago now. Going through something. I wanted to see my pastor. Marie and I went and sat down with him. I shared my heart with him, my tears, my sorrow of my heart at that moment. And he's my pastor, and I love him like a father, and he just listened carefully and I finally finished, and I said, so what do you think, Chuck? And Chuck said to me, well, you're going through things so that you can help other people go through them. You're learning lessons that you can give to other people. And I said to Chuck, can't I learn that by reading a book? <laughs> he said, no. That's why he's no longer my pastor. No, he said, <laughs> he said, no, David. He said, some things you learn by going through. And I can say that to you too. Please don't run from God's hand. Please don't try and avoid the lessons God wants to teach you. Don't be afraid of sorrow. Don't be afraid of grief. Don't be afraid of a sense of loss, please, because there's nothing you've ever lost that, will, lost that will not be returned sevenfold, tenfold. God has a way of, 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 one, allowing things to be removed from us that we shouldn't have, but two, giving us the things that we need. And some of the things I thought I needed were things I didn't need. And some of the things that I thought I didn't need are the things that I most desperately needed. That's how the Lord works. And it works even in the simplest things. I'll give an illustration. When I first went into ministry, I was an assistant. I was 29 years old. I didn't have any friends. And I started praying and I asked the Lord, could you give me a friend? I don't have any friends. It's not that my wife wasn't my friend. Of course she's my friend. But I'd like a guy that I can hang around with, laugh with, a buddy. Could you give me a friend? And so there was a fellow in the church I was assisting in who was one of the elders. <clears throat> he was around my age. He used to make me laugh all the time. He was the kind of guy that when we sat together, we would laugh a lot. And I enjoy laughing. And so he'd make me laugh and I would make him laugh. And I thought this guy would be a great friend because we enjoy ourselves together so much. Well, there was another guy who was real quiet, never really said anything, just real quiet. And, and I didn't connect with him because he was just more quiet than I was comfortable with. So I wanted this other guy to be my buddy. And this quiet guy, he's just a nice guy. He was on the board. One day, I was in a meeting with all the board, and the Lord spoke to my heart. Even as I was sharing recently out of Romans 8, how the Spirit of the Lord leads you, and there are times he communicates with you, I was seated there in this meeting when this guy, the quiet one, began to, to talk. And when he began to speak and share his heart, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, there's your friend. And I looked and I said, no. <laughs> He's not cool. We don't laugh together. It can't be my friend. Well, within a short time after that meeting, when the Spirit of God said, there's your friend, the senior pastor told me, you're not a pastor. You're going to be removed from pastoral ministry. We're cutting your salary. 
You can go back to school because you are not called by God to pastor. And there I am with several other men, and I'm being told I'm not a pastor. And I looked at the senior pastor, and I said, there's only one thing that I know that I am. I've been called by God to pastor. But it's obvious I haven't been called to pastor here. So I said, I resign my position. I give you two weeks' notice. I'll move on. All the board, and there were about 10 or so on the board, all of them received my resignation. Fine. Except for one, Dan. The guy that the Lord said, there's your friend. And I cried. I didn't cry in the meeting. I know you find it hard to believe that I would cry, but <laughs> my heart was broken. And I got up and I walked out the door and closed the door. And I stood in the front porch. And Dan went out with me. Dan was the only member of the board who would not receive my resignation. He said, you're called by God. I will not receive your resignation. I will not. He followed me out. I fell into his arms and I wept like a child in his arms. What am I going to do? Dan became my first assistant pastor. Dan pastors a church now in Washington. And I was at the pastor's conference just last, at the beginning of this month. And I was doing a workshop for Calvary pastors. And I was just like this. My voice hasn't been good for a long time. And I said, man, I wish I had a cup of coffee to strengthen my throat, to dry my throat. Hot coffee helps my vocal cords. And I wish I had some. And he says, what do you want? Dan, who's a senior pastor, who's got his own fellowship that he serves, sitting in the front row in my workshop, didn't have to be there. What do you need? I said, I need a cup of coffee. He goes and he brings me a cup and brings it back. And I tell everybody, I said, he was my first assistant. And he still serves me. That meant something to me, obviously. I get emotional just remembering it. Because God has called us. And God will work through tough times. And he was there with me. And he saw the pain. But look at what God has done. Look at what God has done over the years. Just because you're walking through tough times doesn't mean you're walking alone. God is with you. He comforts you. He strengthens you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He has his way in you. And the comfort that he brings to you, you are equipped to bring comfort to somebody else. That's how it works. And my pastor Chuck was so right when he said, you don't learn these lessons in a book. You learn them through life. And Paul is simply saying, I have a God of all comfort. He has comforted me but not so that I can simply be comforted, but that I can comfort you with the comfort that I have received from him. I can speak, he's saying, with the experience of someone who knows the comfort of God. And I can stand, he can say this, and I can tell you, God will comfort you. God will not forsake you. God will be with you. God loves you, and God will do the work because that's what God does. He loves you, and he comforts you. And Paul can say that, and I can say that. It's the absolute truth. You have a God who comforts you. Absolutely. Absolutely. The key to enduring is looking forward to the results because we know that whatever it is that we go through, is conforming us into the image of Jesus. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, it says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. He is conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. This equips us to encourage hurting people. Now, he says in verse 6, If we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or, if we are comforted, 
It is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. We are equipped to comfort others. Suffering is not mindless. Suffering is not useless. There's a purpose in it. It conforms us into the image of Christ. It strengthens us. It deepens us. And it equips us to give to others that which he has given to us. Our hope is steadfast. This knowledge of God working in us and doing this work encourages us to hold on. And as a result of that, we're able to encourage other people because God has given encouragement to us. Our hope for you, he said in verse 7, is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Even as God has brought consolation into the life of the Apostle Paul, and Paul knows that the things he's gone through, though difficult, were not pointless. Even so, the Corinthians who go through suffering will also reap the same benefits. They will grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. My encouragement to you, hold on. Don't allow the enemy to remove your hand from the hand of the Lord. Hold on. The enemy wants to undermine. He wants to destroy. He wants to cause you to believe it's all pointless. He wants you to believe that you shouldn't have a single bad day in your life. The moment you got saved from that day on, he wants you to believe that everything is supposed to go so well that you never have another sorrow, another tear, another disappointment. But the fact of the matter is, that's just not true. When I got saved, I, I believed that everything was going to just be perfect immediately. And I found out pretty quickly that instead of life getting a lot easier, there were things that actually became a lot more difficult. But over the years, I have discovered one thing, that nothing that I've ever gone through has ever been pointless. That the Lord has been able to take all those broken things broken dreams, my broken heart on occasion. And he's been able to put it back together again. And he's made me stronger. And he's refined my faith. And he's made me more compassionate. And he's begun to teach me what it means to be loved and to love. And that's all come through the times that were not simply the easiest ones came through the times that they were most difficult. The losses, the disappointments, the rejections, the accusations. God has been there through every one of them. He's taught me lessons. But the number one lesson I'm learning with the Lord, is, I've been sharing lately because it's important for me. The number one lesson he's teaching me is he loves me. He doesn't leave me. He's walking with me, and he's taking me to be with him. That matters to me. So no matter what it is you go through, you're not going through it alone. And not only are you not going through it alone, you're being equipped to help somebody else because they're going to go through something too. And there's no guide like one who's been there on that path who can tell you this is the way to step. Be careful for this, but go this way. And I can do that now to some degree. I can say God is faithful. God is faithful. God will take you through. God will have his way. God will cause you to triumph. You will be victorious. You will see the great end that God has for you. You will see this. Why? Because God loves you. He is faithful, and he will never forsake you. I can say that. It's the truth. <laughs>